Um, so my name's Andy, and I work at Unity as a global content evangelist in the Copenhagen office. And basically, my job is to take all the amazing kick-ass things that our development team creates, and make demos, and teach people how to use them. That's basically my job. And I'm going to be presenting Shadergraph, how to create your shaders without code. I'm actually going to spend most of this talk in the editor, because I often find visual effects and shaders and things like this are best shown live in the editor rather than slides. So I'll keep PowerPoint to a minimum, but most of it is in editor. Is that OK with everyone? Hmm. The, the beer hasn't kicked in yet. OK, that's cool. Yeah. So if I push this button, cool. So Shadergraph at a very high level is a visual node-based shader editor. It's developed by Unity's R&D graphics team, uh, part in Copenhagen and part in some other places. And it contains about 100 plus built-in nodes. And when I talked about Shadergraph before, I used to put like an exact number, but they keep adding more. So I just put 100 plus, and it's just easier for me to update slides for presentations. And all these nodes do very different things. Some do very basic math in shaders, like just add two values together or subtract two values. And some do a lot more complex things um, in terms of manipulating UVs or doing some interesting effects. Um, and there's also, for those people who are programmers, so put your hand up if you're a programmer. OK, you all copy paste code. OK, that's nice to know. Um, put your hand up if you're an artist. You'll use crayons, OK, or yeah. well, Microsoft Paint. Uh, put your hand up if you're a uh, game designer. OK, that's usually the one everyone's like, mm. Put your hand up if you work in QA. It's the most important role in the whole uh, thing. So yeah, thanks, Catalina. Uh, put your hand up if you have no idea what a shader is and you just thought this might be cool. Oh, yeah, I know you. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, so those of you who are programmers, which seems to be a good amount of you, there's actually an API to create your own custom nodes. So you can actually extend Shadergraph, which is really, really cool. Admittedly now, this presentation is titled um, Create Your Shaders Without Code. So I haven't got any of that API in the talk, but I'll put up a link at the end for you. And this is when about 75% like, people leave. OK. And Shadergraph has been built to support the new SRPs. I try to fit as many abbreviations into one sentence here. Um, so it's built to support the new scriptal render pipelines that we're releasing, both lightweight render pipeline. And in 2018.2, in the future, Shadergraph also supports the HD render pipeline. And it's actually available now. Everything I'm going to show you is completely available right now. Maybe not on the conference Wi-Fi, but uh, it's available right now. And I'm now going to switch over and do a demo. And PowerPoint did something weird. So here we have a very basic door. And this door is uh, set up. And a lot of this talk is not going to be creating a graph from scratch, but it's going to be showing some scenarios of pretty cool effects that usually people are, their mind's blown that this is possible with shaders, and just how you would create this in Shader Graph and which nodes are very useful uh, to create this effect. So here we have a pretty basic door, but we want to create a kind of like a nice hologram door that dissolves and does some cool like uh, warping type effect because this might be a game where the door is locked and then you have to like destroy 10 enemies and then the, the door opens. So if I select one of these doors and they're in two parts so that I could animate them sliding, which I haven't done, uh, I should have. And you notice that this door is using a standard shader from the lightweight render pipeline. So I'm currently using the lightweight render pipeline. But what I show you is also possible in the HD render pipeline. Now, I don't want to use the lightweight render pipeline standard shader, because it's kind of uh, just going to display textures in each of the maps, like albedo, metallic, normal, and emission. Instead, I'm going to go to this drop-down list, go to this graphs list, and eventually find this locked door shader. And when I apply this, you'll notice a couple of things has happened. One is that this material is now using the shader that I selected from the menu. Another thing is it's changed this door from being that kind of boring metallic door to this kind of weird pulsing glowy effect. And the other is that the material inspector now shows tons of properties and values and sliders. And all these sliders and things manipulate things to do with the door. So here we have a color picker. So someone shout out a color that's not black, white, or pink. Not yellow, it's already yellow. Like, OK, let's just do all of them, and then everyone's happy, right? 
Not pink, because that's the magenta thing. But you can see that all of these exposed properties in the material inspector are influencing this shader. And we can also obviously also change some elements like this, uh, make things like super pulsy, change the speed, you know, like, uh, like this, and change all sorts of different things. Now, this is possible in Unity today. You would just write a really long shader with lots and lots of code, which some of you are thinking, hooray, this is, that's amazing. I love writing thousands of lines of code to create an effect like this. Some of you are nodding. Yeah, this is, this is what I wake up to do. Um, but some of you don't want to write hundreds and hundreds of lines of code to create an effect like this. You want to do things visually. So this exact effect is actually created entirely in Shader Graph. So you can open a Shader Graph in many different ways. So you, you typically would create a shader graph by going to the project window, going to create, going to create, going to the shader option, and then choosing one of these graph options. And we still give people the opportunity to write their shaders uh, via hand code. That's not going away. But we give people options to create a PBR graph, which outputs to the different PBR uh, channels and maps, a subgraph, which I'll talk about later, and an unlit graph, which doesn't have lighting data and things like this. It's very useful for games with no lights or 2D and things like this. Instead, I'm going to go to my material, click the little cog, and edit this shader. And what this will do is it'll open up the shader graph editor. And if I zoom out, you'll notice that there are three sort of key elements to do with each graph. One is this central sort of node interface where you see all the different nodes connecting together to create the effect. And you can uh, pan around and zoom in and out and do all sorts of uh, things. The second is this little window in the bottom right corner. But it could be in the top left if I want, but you can move it around how you want. And this is a preview of what the shader looks like on a mesh or of your choice. So if I right click here, I can swap this out to be a sphere if I really wanted to and see what the shader looks like on a sphere. So you can actually go through and choose you know, what type of, uh, you know, on a quad, kind of boring, on a capsule, kind of cool, on a custom mesh. So this will take anything. And I've got one of the pieces of the door. And the way that shader graph works is it moves from left to right. So if I move into this far right graph here, uh, far right node here, you notice that we've got a master node. And this is kind of the end of the shader graph. It's basically where everything channels into. And it's using a PBR master node, which means that each of the channels that are being output, albedo, normal, emission, metallic, all kind of match up to the standard shader. So you can output things into different channels. And one of the things I want to really show in Shader Graph is these four blocks here. And you notice that each of them is showing a live update of what the node is doing. So what we've tried to do is add as many previews at various stages in your shader. So you can, rather than wait, putting together like 20 nodes and then you see what the result is at the end, you can really see how that shader evolves. So here we have this, uh, this effect kind of really faint. Then here, then we apply some kind of noise to it. And then here, we then uh, don't do anything with it. And then here we add a color. You can see each of the steps all the way down, all live, all the way to this end node. So each of these nodes does a different thing. So if I zoom into this one, this is probably one of those basic nodes you can make, and it's an add node. It basically takes two values, an, uh, an A value and a B value, adds them together, and outputs the result. It's really simple. And every node has this kind of concept. So here we've got a very like a Verne noise node um, where you input the UV and you input the angle offset and cell density and then it outputs the result. So I could do things like uh, set this to like 30 and then basically you see that that change then propagates to all the other nodes down the graph. I can't remember what value that was. Minus five. Yep. So. If I go down to this bottom left-hand corner, here is a node structure of some very basic nodes, multiply, a time node, so things happen over time, which is pretty cool. And it's creating this effect. So you can see here that it's taking this texture and scrolling it and making this kind of sort of reveal hologram. I think I just watched one of the Star Wars movies and really liked the R2-D2 effect uh, when he shoots out the hologram. Spoiler for anyone who hasn't seen Star Wars 4. And what you can notice here is that this output, I can actually grab this output and actually connect it to another node. So if I now connect it into this node here and add it together, you'll notice 
that very instantly it gets added to this node, and you see that all the nodes after it, it updates in the previews. And you see it gets down to the end, so you can see it's actually applying to this preview. So you can connect nodes together to create new sort of visual effects or shaders. Now, if I come down to this area here, we've got a noise node. And this noise node is hooked up to a step function, which is very common in shaders to split a value um, between true or false or black or white. And here it's hooked up to a slider. And this is basically, everyone's always blown away how you do a dissolve. And it's like, hey, look, it's four nodes. You can even just copy paste this into another shader graph if you want. You notice that we have this pretty cool dissolve effect. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to hook this up to this multiply node. And we now have, after this slider, that result taking place to all the other nodes, including the preview. Pretty cool, right? Maybe? No? Yeah, thank you, that one person. That person was probably sat on a chair. So, yeah. so what we have here is we now have this slider hooked up to this uh, sort of dissolved door effect. Now, that's OK, but this slider sits inside the graph and isn't exposed. And we want to expose this to the material inspector in Unity so we can actually like preview it in the scene, because here it's kind of pointless. We want to see how it looks in our environment. And this is where this um, window in the top left-hand corner comes in use. And this is called the blackboard, but it's basically a list of all the different properties that are exposed. And clicking this plus, you can see here that we can add lots of different properties, such as vector 1, vector 2, vector 3, color, texture 2D, cube map, and even a Boolean to toggle on and off different things in the shader. So you can either add elements to here. So I could add a texture 2D, give it a name, and then actually drag this into the uh, shader um, interface. Or instead, I can take this slider. Actually, let's get rid of that. Yeah, why not? I can take this slider. I can actually right click it and convert it to a property. And you'll see now that slider becomes a property node. And it's now added here with a slider value set. And I can actually name this something like, what is dissolve in German? Or is that a bad thing to ask? Dissolve, OK. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not even, I don't have, probably don't have the right keys on my keyboard, and you know. So I've now got this dissolve um, effect, uh, dissolve property. If I now save this asset, let's go back, into, go back into the inspector, you can see here, look, hey, look, dissolve is here. Or if you're German, just imagine it saying what, what word you said. And you notice that as I move this slider, look, we can now preview this effect directly on the material. So you can expose properties from ShaderGraph out and change values and send it back, which is pretty cool. Well, I think it's pretty cool. Maybe it is. Yeah. So you can see here, I can then change this effect and have this pretty cool dissolve. So I'm going to go over to my next, uh, next uh, victim. So here we have this little uh, floating drone robot. And it's got a sphere around it that's uh, transparent. It has this kind of like uh, hexagon texture around it. If I select this hexagon texture, you notice that I've exposed a couple of values. One is kind of the strength of how much this force field has. Another one is the uh, edge color. So someone shout out a color. Not pink. OK. You've asked for it. Although this helps me, because if the shader doesn't compile, it's going to look the same. So, well, sort of. And also a slider to expose how much tiling there is. But there's one thing that, um, that this uh, force field has, which I'm not too happy about, and that's it's basically applying this texture across the UV of this sphere. And that's not really interesting. It's kind of wrapping around the sphere. And maybe I want the force field to instead kind of have a little bit of, a, I guess, distortion around the edge or kind of be locked to the position of the camera. So let's open up the shader graph and see what we can do. So this actually graph is actually very basic. We have a Fresnel node, because we have Fresnel node support. And this Fresnel node is multiplied by color. So it's going from white to blue or pink or whatever you want. And it's being output to the color um, node in the master. And then also, we're outputting a, that Fresnel to the alpha value. And then here, you'll notice that this texture is using a tiling and offset, and it's asking for a UV. And it's just going to use UV0 from the uh, mesh or the uh, model. So let's say we wanted to add some extra nodes into ShaderGraph or use extra nodes. You can go to any space within the graph window, 
right click and go create node. Or you can just hit spacebar, which I'm lazy, so I usually do that way. And then this opens up a contextual menu that show, has all the built-in nodes, both built-in one, oh, all the nodes, both built-in, and if you write custom nodes as well. And it splits them into groups. So I could go under artistic and adjustment, and we have all sorts of different nodes for inverting colors, replacing colors, saturation. Let's have a look at some other cool stuff. Inputs. I can actually get data from like the ambient lighting in the scene, which is cool. I could get all the, I could, I could actually get all the camera data, like position, direction, orthographic. Basically, you can get lots of really cool uh, bits and pieces. So what I'm actually going to do is zoom out. What I'm actually going to do is I want to not use a UV from the model. I actually want to use a UV from the view direction. So I'm going to open up this window. You can also type, and it will search. So I'm going to get the position node. And the position node is pretty cool because it, you can set things to be, is it in the object space, world space? <laughs> That's, that wasn't a node. <laughs> that was Slack. <laughs> that was actually my manager as well. So I'm now shaming him on the, the stream. <laughs> so here, um, we have here object, world, tangent, and let's get the view position. So I get the view position. I can then output this into this UV. A couple of things change, but now when I save the asset and then go back into here, you'll notice that as I change the tiling down a little bit, it's now actually rendering that texture in a sort of view or sort of screen space. So it means that you can actually do all sorts of really cool stuff uh, like this. Yep. So you can now have a kind of sort of force field, and as this drone walks around, moves around, it kind of looks a little hologrammy or like a little shield bubbly. So let's go up here. So here are some assets that are used from the 3D game kit. And this is quite a common thing that a lot of people ask. They say, hey, we want, we want to lay out a level, but have like a grass layer on top of everything using like the up direction. So this is this graph. So if I select, for example, this uh, monument here, and then I rotate it, you notice that the grass layer is always going to be on the very top of this uh, mesh. Everyone always asks how you make this, and it's, I'll, I'll now show you. Oh, and all the examples I'm going to show you, I have a downloadable link at the end that you can download. I pushed it to Git like an hour ago on the conference Wi-Fi. Well, I hope it's pushed on the conference Wi-Fi. It's been interesting. But yeah. So we have this grass layer. And the grass layer is exposed to a couple of things. One is the tiling of the grass. Another is the position of the grass. So if, as I move this split position value, You'll notice that you can say, hey, we want the whole thing to be grass, or we want the whole thing to be rock. So you can do cool, various cool things like this. And you can also set like a noise value. So if I crank up the noise value quite a lot, you'll notice that rather than the grass sort of having an automatic fall off, it actually dissolves a bit better. And I can also rotate it and have this grass layer. So if I look to these objects here, you'll notice I have a sphere and this, uh, this, this rock. And if I move this rock around, you'll notice that the grass layer actually moves around in world space. And as I set the fall off, you'll notice that on the sphere, it's actually like a hard edge on the fall off. Basically, what it's doing is it's splitting based in the object's, uh, in the object's vertex, uh, the vertex object position. And it's basically determining where you want this uh, grass fall off. So let's actually have a look at the graph to see how what well, is in it. And you'll notice that it's actually quite kind of, it's got a lot of nodes. It looks a little messy. And I'll show you how to tidy this up in a little bit. But if you look to the top here, I'm using two different nodes. One is for the rock layer. And this just basically uh, uses a sample texture node that just wraps the texture around uh, a UV. And the other is a triplanar node, which is what, what we have built in. And the triplanar node is being used for the grass layer. So if I go to the preview and like move this object around, you'll notice that the top layer is remaining the same because it's not moving, whereas the bottom layer is moving. So kind of split these two in half. So the triplanar is one you want to use if you want to take a texture and map it in world space, whereas the sample texture is if you kind of just want it in a UV. And both of these then go down to a lerp between the two values, both rock and grass layer. And the value used to lerp is this structure here. So we have input for the normal vector from the, um, the object, this through a dot product node. 
And this is then using that same step where they fall off, and that's then going in here. And one thing you'll notice is that this same structure to do that split is used three times. Once here, once here, once here, which seems like kind of a waste of uh, extra nodes. You then have to maintain it, and you want to change one of the, thing com uh, change one of the sets. Um, it's going to be kind of tricky or fiddly to do. Um, and the reason why it's done three times is because we have to split it for both the albedo slot, the normal slot, and the metallic slot. So this seems a little messy, and eventually when you start making much more complex graphs, you're going to add lots more nodes, and there's going to be a lot of repetition and things like this. So what I'm now going to do is instead of using this node, this graph, I'm going to switch it to another graph example. And this other graph example looks like this. And it looks almost the same, except it's, it has still that same split position, but now it's using a noise value around the edge. So you notice we have this like grassy noise fall off. And if I open up this graph, you'll notice that it's a lot more organized. We don't have that duplicated kind of split structure over and over again. Instead, what we do is we do have this subgraph. And in Shader Graph, we have this concept of subgraphs, which are kind of like nested graphs. I had to say that. Um, which are kind of like nested graphs, where you basically input into a subgraph different values. So here is the top texture, the split position, the noisy edge, or the noise scale, and then the bottom texture, and it outputs a value. And if I double click that subgraph and open it, Look at this. So it's, this is basically a sub-node that's embedded. And you can take this and embed it in, say, a snow sh layer shader or a sand layer shader or anything like that. And it's kind of uh, agnostic to what you want to split. So here you'll notice that it's doing a couple of things. And it outputs a value to this other um, graph. So you notice here it's taking this grass layer, this rock layer, and making a split. And I use exactly the same uh, subgraph for the normal split. Exactly the same subgraph for the metallic split. So you can reuse subgraphs many, many times. That way you can go into one subgraph, make some changes, and all instances of the subgraph update. So yeah, it seems like people ask for nesting things for a while, and then we just add it to multiple features at the same time. How cool is that? We're, we're aligning it all up. We're waiting for the, the features to align or something. So now when we go back, You'll notice here that we have this, it looks almost the same, still can move around, and we have this grass layer, and we have this kind of triplanar um, shader. OK, let's have a look over here. So here we have a couple of spider robots. And the far left spider robot is using the lightweight render pipeline standard shader, which has all your typical standard um, elements, such as albedo map, metallic map, normal map, occlusion map, emission map, and the usual things that you have in a standard shader. But one thing that a lot of people ask me is they ask me, how do you do kind of like a toon ramp fall off shader? That's like, I want to make toon games. I don't care about PBR games. I want to make toon games. So here we have the exactly the same spider robot. And this exact same spider robot has um, this kind of like hard fall off. So you see here on the spider robot, rather than having a nice fall off in terms of the lighting from the light direction, it's instead got a hard cut edge using a ramp. And this spider robot has the same, but a kind of half gray edge. And if I then select this spider robot and have a look at its shader graph, all the properties exposed from shader graph, it has this albedo texture, and it has this color ramp texture. And if I change this color ramp texture, to say this one, or this one, or this one, you'll notice that it's being applied to that light. It's getting the light direction and very slowly using the shader for the fall off. I even have a rainbow shader somewhere, because, you know, why not? And you could basically throw anything. Uh, I didn't even know what I was going to achieve by doing that, I'll be honest. So you can see here we can set different tone, uh, different ramps uh, to the, uh, the graph. And what these ramps do is basically they take the far right part of the texture as kind of closest to the light direction, and then it slowly has that fall off to the left side. So if I now open up the graph and see what this looks like, let's take a look and save this asset here. So this is using an unlit master node, because we don't want lighting and stuff. We just want to output a color. It has our texture. 
But if we go all the way to the beginning, it basically uses the normal vector node. And the normal vector node is set to world space. So we're getting the world direction of the normal vector. Here, we're doing a dot product. So we're actually working out the direction of the normal vector and then basically finding the fall off from it, from this, uh, this property, which I'll talk about in a bit. We went, then remap it using the remap node, which basically means it takes the in, um, in, min, and max, and then remaps it slightly. It's really, really cool. And then it's outputting it here across that texture. And the interesting thing here is that with this tune light direction uh, property here, which you can see here, is it's actually using some new features. So if you've used Shader Graph before, a lot of people, this basically I'm showing a lot of things that we've added uh, that's new that a lot of people ask for. And one is that this tune di light direction property is not exposed, the tick is turned off. And the other one is that you can now, in Shader Graph from 2018.2, write reference names or reference properties to be accessible from scripts. So here we have an underscore tune light direction um, value. And here we also have a tune light color, uh, which uses underscore tune light color. So if I then save that asset, and remembering those values, because that's really important, and go back into Unity, if I take this light here and then rotate it, you'll notice that it's then going to use that light direction as I wrote it fall off. And that's because this light, and it, I can say this because the room's full of programmers, uses a script. So if I now have a look at this script, it basically is just doing the standard set global value or basically going to that underscore tune light direction. So this was something that sort of wasn't really working in Shader Graph before because properties would be exposed as kind of like texture underscore A, B, one, two, three, four, five, which isn't really nice to write so many times or animate to. So now you can actually write down your own reference names. So here we're just setting the tune light direction and the tune light color. So now we can access values in Shader Graph from script. And I think I can also do things like Someone give me another color, not pink. Magenta. Magenta. OK, thank you. <laughs> Everything is now going to be pink. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. I'm going to change it back to white. So we have here this, uh, this ramp fall off. Now, you're probably wondering why we ha I have two spider robots. And the reason why I have two spider robots is because this one uses a slightly different method. If I get this spider robot and find its uh, shader, it just has a texture. It doesn't have a ramp fall off. So where is it actually getting that data from? Where is it getting the fall off data to say that it has this white area, this gray hard fall off, and this black area at the bottom? So if I open up the graph and have a look at it, and I have to save it so that everything renders. I'm using a beta version, so that's why I have to do that. You'll notice here that we actually now have support in Shader Graph for the, the gradient editor that's uh, built into Unity. So this means that I can actually directly inside the graph set the ramp fall off using this gradient because I'm basically doing the same as that tune ramp but across the gradient. So here I can set this color. So someone give me a color, please, not magenta. Green. Green. I had green. I'm going to stop crowdsourcing colors soon, and uh, you'll just have to deal with my terrible lack of artist, artistic vision. So let's go for something. Uh, wow, that looks horrible. OK, let's go for something dark here, and then go for something a little light here. So you notice here that we have this uh, ramp, like so. It then gets passed into a sample gradient node. And then this is then used for this fall off ramp. So if I now save this asset, oh, and you'll notice also in the properties that we have underscore tune light direction and uh, the same exposed uh, property uh, reference names. If I go back, hey presto, it's already using it. How cool is that? So um, almost as if I knew that was going to work. Um, ish. So you notice here that we very quickly have that fall off already set up um, on here. And you can also combine this. You could create a subgraph called like tune ramp, and then just drop it into every shader graph that you want to use that same tune ramp fall off. Pretty cool, right? I guess so. Yep. So here is a uh, eel dog thing. I bet you weren't expecting that. 
And this eel dog thing is also from the 3D game kit. It actually swims around underwater. And probably one of the most requested features in Shadergraph is a vertex offset. And in 2018.2, we are adding that. So here is this eel dog thing. And this is its just base mesh. And I can switch to wireframe mode and show you there's nothing amazing about this eel dog, other than it looks pretty cool. And it's not using an animator or anything. So we could go in and animate bones along it, because it's kind of a weird shape, and it's got little stumpy hands and things like this. Um, but instead, we can actually use vertex offset and shader graph in that master node to basically offset um, the vertices. So at the bottom of this graph, and I'll show you in a second, I have wobble speed, because I'm imaginative with names, wobble speed, wobble distance, and wobble frequency. So if I now increase wobble distance, you'll notice that it's going to set the distance that the wobble take, takes place. I'm just going to move it up, because this is going to get very wobbly in a second, and I don't want it to clip. So now we've got a never-ending story start type uh, thing. And wobble frequency specifies how many time, how frequent are, is the sine wave, because it's basically just using a sine wave. So if I now increase that, I haven't heard one person say, oh, like, yeah. So everyone's laughing at this poor, this poor creature. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> And of course, you can. Whoop. This is super fun to play with, by the way. Of course, you can make it go backwards. So let's do like 10. Uh, let's do minus 5. OK. So basically, it's offsetting the vertices. And this is actually really, really, really easy to do. Loads of people are like, wow, that's some black magic. And I'm like, it's like 10 nodes. It's really simple. By the way, here it is. You can download it right now and apply this to houses, cars, people, trees. I'm going to put it in the Book of the Dead and have like all the, the trees and logs wobbling. That's going to be pretty cool. So if I actually open the graph, let's have a look and see what it does. So this is a new addition in 2018.2. And we now have a position that you can output from uh, into the graph, output from the shader. And let's take a whoop. Thank you. Um, so let's take a look what this does. So here, I have a time node, which does something over time. And I multiply that by the speed, so of how fast it is. And here, I also have a position node. So I'm getting the position in object space of the mesh. And using a split node in Shadergraph, I can then get the third channel, the Z channel. So what it's doing is it's basically taking, if I, if I actually go back, it's basically getting, and tell it to stop wobbling, it's basically getting the Z position of the actual mesh from the front to the back. So I'm getting that Z position. And that's going to come in use in the sine wave. And then multiply that by the frequency. So how, how much do I want? I add those together. And then we have a built-in sine node, which does this kind of very weird strobing type, uh, type thing. Multiply that by distance. It's just multiplying things by the sine. And this is kind of a very common thing that you will probably be doing using the position output. So you have the position node here. I split it to get x, y, z. And I think, hmm, which direction do I want this sine wave to travel in? And currently, on this uh, eel dog uh, fish, I don't, know. I don't know what this is, the sine wave is uh, taking place, if I actually rotate from this side, the sine wave is actually um, going across. So it's going across the eel thing. And it's basically offsetting it in the y value up and down. Maybe I don't want it to offset in the y value. Maybe I want it to slither side to side like a snake. So that's going to be the, um, I actually forgot which one it was. The z value, I think. Well, we'll find out soon. Oh, the x value. So rather than outputting this y value and then recombining it to then go to the position node, I'm instead going to take this x value. That preview is going to look really weird in a second. And connect this up. So I'm just outputting the x value down into that sine wave and then recombining it. And you'll notice here we have this very strange sort of slithering blob thing. If I now go back. Uh, uh, creature now instead uses the sine wave across the, its z position from the front to the back, 
but instead of going up and down, it's instead slithering from side to side. And of course, we can do all sorts of really cool stuff. So the power of shader graph is that you can set up all this logic behind scenes and then expose these properties to then play around with and have fun with. So I could, I could put this on a house if I wanted to and have the house all wobble using the same graph. And just because it looks hilarious, I'm in, I've done it in uh, the x di direction and the y direction. So let's do it in the z direction because it looks really, really strange. And this is kind of the whole point. Actually, that looks really cool. Hang on, this. Nope, let's, I think it's this one. OK, this is probably going to flatten it, but yeah. OK, that just looks really strange. But yeah, you can connect all these different nodes and properties together and have fun with them without writing a line of code. So um, sort of just, uh, well, oh, wow, I've got lots of time left, so I can talk about some more cool stuff. So each of these nodes basically contributes to this end graph. And one thing a lot of people ask me about is, hey, how do I, how do I actually view the code generated from Shader Graph? I want to know what it's doing. I want to perhaps use some nodes and then see what the code is doing. There's a couple of things you can do. One is you can go to the master node, right click, and show the generated code. OK, it doesn't show the generated code. OK, one thing is you can right click, copy, and then show the generated code, OK? So what this is going to do is that should work. This is a beta software, OK? Um, so what that will do is it will basically take all the nodes up to that point and show what the generated uh, code looks like. You notice here I've got my imaginative naming of wobble speed, wobble frequency, and things like this. So you can actually see what this is actually outputting. And you can go in, play around with it. You can see that it's using different blending. So if you're very comfortable with writing shaders, you can view what it's actually doing. If instead you don't care about the entire generated code stack, you can actually go like to here and then view just the gen. I'm not going to click this because uh, it was so certain it would work last time. And view the generated code up to that node point. So if you have a big graph of 40, 50 different nodes, and you don't want to see the whole thing, you can instead move further up the stack and then see what it looks like from that exact point. Actually, I feel really sorry for this, uh, this dragon thing. So let's move it back to go, yep, that seems pretty cool. The other really cool thing is that Shader Graph is actually on uh, GitHub. So if you go to the Unity-Technologies uh, GitHub uh, company, organization, I can't remember what it's called. There's a repository called Scriptal Render Pipeline. And underneath here, we have a, the Shader Graph library. And you can actually go in and actually read the C-sharp written to create all the nodes. So if you're interested in writing your own nodes or seeing actually what each node does, you can actually take that code and actually combine it or sort of look in what's happening in the background. So this museum of uh, weird critters and things is actually all available on GitHub right now in a project called the Example Library. And there's a library I've been building up for a little while where I keep adding extra examples. And as we add new features and as people ask for more things, they ask for a lot of things, I assure you, um, I'll be at contributing to this library. And you can actually take this right now. Um, other things in the Example Library are this, as well as these sort of scenario examples, is this. So if I go to this, uh, yeah, why not? If I go to this scene here, you might have seen this before. This is a lineup of this uh, character. And this is all using different shader graph examples. So here is our good friend, Mr. Rimlight, around uh, the character. A kind of weird scrolling texture, an Apple advert. Um, here we have a sliced um, effect, which if you've written shaders before or looked at Unity's documentation, this is like really common in the documentation to have this sliced effect. And I basically recreated this entirely in Shader Graph, including being able to set you know, how sliced the character is. Here is another example of doing sort of like a triplanar effect, in this case, a snow layer. So if I actually select this player and then do, uh, let's do it around the center. You know, this snow layer is always going to be on top of the player. Here's another example of a tune ramp. Here is another dissolve example, and here is a hologram. So basically, you can download this example library, um, have fun with it, 
take all the graphs and put them in your game, dissect them, and do all sorts of really cool stuff. One of the other cool things you can do is you can actually take the graphs, and rather than being separate windows directly in Unity, you can actually dock them to sections of the editor. So if I take this hologram effect, which looks uh, kind of fun, and edit this shader, you'll notice it pops out to this window here. So I can actually take this, dock it to, say, here, and actually work on, obviously, I'd have to like, resize things because it was for full screen. So I can actually set up some different things on this, um, on this interface. So I could go here and say, oh, instead of the screen position, let's instead use a twirl node, which takes the UV and twirls it. Save that asset. We now have this like, strange warping effect. So you can actually work in the graph and directly docked inside the Unity editor and play around with things. And another cool thing you can do is you can actually open multiple graphs at the same time. So if I now open this uh, color rim shader and decrease the window, you'll notice here that I can actually have two shader graphs open at exactly the same time. You can copy paste nodes from one to another. So if you download this example library, you can open up one of the monstrosities or nice shaders in there and sort of copy over nodes or see how it was created and apply it to your own uh, project. Uh, who makes 2D games out of interest? OK, there's enough. OK, cool. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about you. OK. OK, so here is uh, Ellen, or well, one of the, char uh, the character from the 2D game kit. So this is uh, shaders. So the top left one is actually using the default sprites, and this one is using a graph. Um, sprite shader, and they basically look the same. And then at the bottom, they obviously look very different. So the far left is actually using that same hologram system applied to the 3D character, but now applied to the Ellen sprite. This one's doing like kind of a glowing pulse here. This one's a gradient. And this one is actually using um, a point light with a normal map on the sprite. So this is actually just a okay, where I can see it. This is actually just a sprite, but a lot of people are like, wow, this is a 3D object. How cool is that? And if I actually move this around, you'll notice that there's a pretty cool kind of fall off. That's because in the graph, it's actually set up to use a normal map uh, with the sprite. So we have some examples for sprite-based um, shader graphs. And the last one I'll show you is this kind of very strange thing here. So this is a bunch of quads. These are all individually quads. They all do different things. And none of these use a single texture. Every single one of these is created using all the built-in nodes in that library, including all the very strange stuff like Dissolve or this warp here. I actually showed this to someone today, and they were like, oh, I have an AR project that could totally take that warp effect, copy the nodes, throw it in, and then do this really cool sort of like wormhole effect. So all of these are created entirely in ShaderGraph. And they're sort of supposed to be used as a reference. So if you really like this Dissolve in and out, and you want this uh, to use this for anything, you, of course, can open up the graph. I've tried to keep these as, as neat and as uh, simple as possible. And you can have a look at how this node structure created this effect. So kind of what I'm trying to really talk about is that this example library, you can open these up, use it, and then learn from them. And you can use them in all your games, whatever. Send me an email afterwards, because I like to see what people do with them. And you can customize them, make them better. Send me a pull request, and I'll happily have a look. So. If I now cut back to here, this is the GitHub repository, which you can download the example library from. But I'll go to the most infamous slide, which is this uh, sort of end slide here. So ShaderGraph is actually available in Unity 2018.1 and up. So it's already out. Um, it's already out in uh, preview, I think. Um, and you can download it from the package manager, which I'll actually, I have a bit of time, so I'll actually show you where you can download that from. But it's also a GitHub, so you can actually look at the source of the shader graph and what is actually happening in each of the nodes. And the extra resources, one is that example library. So everything I showed you today is actually already on GitHub and downloadable. Do it at your hotel, not on the conference Wi-Fi, otherwise it'll take too long. Um, and all those uh, extra examples I showed you with like the eel thing and the spider robots are in the 2018.2 branch. There's another guy I want to shout out to, and that's Kajiro. Does everyone recognize that name? 
Yeah, his GitHub's like Aladdin's cave of amazing Unity repositories, and he has so much cool stuff on there, and I don't know how he finds time to sleep, I'll be honest. But he's done a, also a shader graph examples, and he does some cool things like static TV and weird dissolves. Everyone seems to make a dissolve shader in shader graph. Um, try and make some other stuff, because that would be cool. Um, so he does a lot of really, really cool stuff as well with shader graph. So there's plenty of examples uh, to use. And I'll cut back to Unity because I want to talk about Package Manager. So when you download Unity, Shader Graph won't be in by default or when you create a new project. If you go to Window and then Package Manager at the top, you'll notice that we have this new package system where you can actually go to all these different systems which would usually sit on random GitHub repositories or Bitbucket or uh, 20th forum post on page 5 on a sub-forum, <laughs> and that's where all the magical cool stuff is. Instead, we're trying to consolidate a lot of packages, a lot of Unity systems into this one interface. So here you've got things that you've probably heard of, Cinemachine, TextMesh Pro, ProBuilder, and things like this. And you can also have Shader Graph. And Shader Graph is also a part of the render pipeline. So when you download one of the render pipelines and install it in your project, Shader Graph will come with that render pipeline, which is pretty cool. So that's the package manager. And you can also look for updates. I'm not going to do this on stage, because that seems a little uh, risky. Um, but you can also update. So as we add a new sort of Shader Graph um, example and things like this, or a new Shader Graph build with new features, you can actually download it from Pac-Man. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'll leave this slide up here. If people have some more questions about Shader Graph or want to see some more stuff, then come find me uh, now in QA or um, afterwards. I'll be walking around the conference, so come say hi. We can talk about Shader Graph, 2D, time apps, prefabs, um, anything really. Um, thanks for sitting in this room and drinking beer and watching some, some weird fish dogs and things. And uh, thank you, Sean.